Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, the Malkin Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and this is the second of two programs with John Sexton, who has now become president of New York University itself, assuming the leadership of the nation's largest private university, and without any question, bringing to it all the skill and enthusiasm and boundless energies that characterized his many years as dean of its highly acclaimed law school. And as I noted last time, what President Sexton most importantly brings to NYU is that same wonderful sense that he nurtured at the law school, namely that an academic leader and students and faculty and trustees must all be intimately involved together in a single great enterprise, working not as competitors or independent contractors or solo players, but rather as parts, as I've noted, always of a larger whole of a splendid orchestra that together makes great music. Well, that was our theme last time, and I want to continue with it now, and I want to ask you, Mr. President, if I may, it's so nice, I like saying Mr. President to you. Uh, <laughs> it's John, Richard. <laughs> well, I, I, Mr. President, uh, I, I, I want to ask about that word enterprise and about you mentioned before, while we were off the air, you, you used the word myth. How do you connect those? Well, for, first of all, uh, bear, bear in mind that um, I'm a student of religion. My, my first discipline before law was, was religion. I, I was chairman of a religion department before I went to law school. Need, may I interrupt? Need anyone be concerned about that in a nation that is so eager to separate state and church? Tell well, uh, they, they certainly shouldn't be concerned about the fact that, so, that a fellow named John studied, studied, studied religion, uh, even if he becomes president uh, of the United States. It didn't do any damage in 1960, and it won't do damage with me becoming president no, of minute, NYU. Wait, wait a minute. I, I, I think you're not taking seriously enough my no, question. No, I'm not, because I, I don't think you're taking no, it seriously. No, doggone it. <laughs> doggone it. I am taking it seriously. You have in the university yeah. so many people, particularly in the university, and I don't mean NYU, right, I right. mean in the university generically, so many non-believers, so many people who reject the role of religion in anything, right. that when you talk about your background, and I tried to get at this in the last program and was too gentlemanly <laughs> to push it. Well, I'm not a gentleman any longer. And I want to ask you whether there, there is any concern about your pastoral inclination? Well, uh, f first I was a comparative religionist. Uh, I, I, I was not a missionary. I'm not a missionary. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, although it's, it's reasonably widely known in, in the NYU community that I'm a Catholic and, and identify myself as such, it's also reasonably widely known that my wife is Jewish and that we've raised our two children Jewish and that my my Italian, formerly Catholic daughter-in-law, uh, so Italian Catholic that uh, that at her grandmother's funeral, Richard, as the, as they, as in this in this working-class Baltimore Italian Catholic church, as they pushed the coffin down the center aisle, I I I, I would tried hard to recognize what the the hymn was, the organist was playing, and suddenly I realized it was the theme from The Godfather. 
That's how Italian Catholic my daughter-in-law was, and she's converted to Judaism. So I'm the only Goy left standing in my family. I'm a person of great <laughs> religious tolerance. And the last thing, I, I don't think that NYU should have an official coffee, let alone an official, an official religion. And I don't think anyone is concerned that my, my pastoral nature is anything more than uh, a concern for the beings uh, with whom we interact at the university and with whom I interact as a person, and a concern for the entirety of their being, and a sense that the, the mission of education is, is, is a calling, and is a calling to, uh, to advance humankind. Uh, well, I know that you once pointed out that de Tocqueville indicated that Americans uh, turned to the law, really, rather than to religion. And I thought to myself when I came to know you, John Sexton, lawyer, pastor in many ways. And I thought that Tocqueville had really been talking about you because I don't mean this in a negative way. I think that the great qualities of personality, of concern, of care for others, indeed in the very construction of your notion of enterprise, mm -hmm. bringing together all people, stems to a very great deal from a sense that is, I would call it spiritual, religious, if you will. I, I, there's no question to that. Uh, you're, you're right. Uh, and perceptive as, as usual. And you teach me about myself w w w when we go out for our lunches. But uh, now let me show you an even additional uh, dimension that comes from my being a student of religion. And it comes back to this, uh, this notion of myth that you, you introduced earlier. Uh, I, I think uh, in, in this sense, I take myth to be the, the story that captures the essential truth experientially, not cognitively. You know, Aristotle said, we know the great things experientially, not cognitively. I know my wife loves me, not because she reasoned me to it, but because I experienced that. I, uh, those of us who believe it, that there's more to life than what we see b know that experientially, not cognitively. And I think that communities are formed experientially, not cognitively. They're, they're, I mean, some communities uh, are formed by mountains or by languages and, and that create you know, a past. But even that becomes told in a story, which then becomes part of the definition of being for all the people that are, that are in the community. And that's the way institutions operate. You know my theory that uh, the beginning of the unraveling of Western civilization came in 1957 when the Dodgers moved from Brooklyn because, you know, any myth could be broken, for heaven's sakes, if the Dodgers could break asunder there. Uh, Who cared about the Dodgers? It was the Giants well, moving that is, bothered me. This is one of your great character flaws, but let's not go there because I, I don't think it would reveal the better side of you, and that wouldn't be charitable of me. But in any case, I, I think that communities uh, are bound together by the stories they create of themselves. And I think, to go back to something we were discussing in the last show, uh, it's very difficult uh, for the leader of an institution, and now we're going to talk about universities or, or, or schools within universities, it's very difficult for the leader uh, to, uh, to create a story that leads unless he or she steps back and reflects upon the ratio studiorum of, 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 of the institution. But once you do that, then one can begin to tell a story. And in the dilemma we began to surface in the last show, uh, you know, what, what, what worked retail at NYU Law School, can it work wholesale in this vast community? In that dilemma, I believe that the answer comes in large part from creating a story, from creating a mythology, a mythology that is, is tethered to what's there. Because if it's not tethered to what's being experienced on the ground by the people in the institution, then it won't be believed. It'll be dismissed as pathological. But uh, the story can begin to become part of, of what leads the institution forward. And 
Therefore, it becomes the function of the dean, the president, the, you know, the, other, the other leaders around the institution to, to listen carefully, to observe carefully, to see what's there, to see what the asset base is, and then begin to articulate the story of what is there in terms of of what ought to be, you know, just moving the institution forward uh, in the process of iterating and reiterating that. So, so I've already begun to say to the deans at NYU, to, to the faculty senate, to the students with whom I meet, don't follow me. I don't want anybody to follow me. That's not my job, okay? I'm, I'm the homer of our community. Listen to me tell the story and then tell me how you'd like to make it better the next time I tell it, so that each time the story is told. And I, that's what I will be, the itinerant listener articulator. And I'm going, you know, I have my own drives. I mean, is there, I, I have to have a sense of utility in place, you know, the useful life, you know, because if it could be any listener articulator, then, you know, I should go do something else, you know. But so, you know, I bring my own being, my own demand to, to the system in terms of my norms, but listen and we will reiterate the story. So a lot of what I've been doing to, tr to, to, to try to bring the enterprise notion, uh, first of the faculty member and concurrently with the students, but the, the, the fa students will follow faculty. Is it working? Oh, I, 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 look, I don't know. I, I, you know what, I, what I said to the trustees, we had our our uh, latest trustee meeting uh, four days ago, and I said, I think there's a 60% chance that we will do something really significant, that we will become one of the you know, three or four uh, 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 places that, that gets the blend between this environment of hyperchange in which universities act and, and the core and the essence of a university. We'll be among the three or four that will lead people to the right blend in place. 60% chance. So 35% chance, I told them, that uh, will destroy the place trying. Because in order to create ownership and to, to bring people into the enterprise, you, you have to be much more transparent about what you're doing. You have to, you have to, you have to be willing to, to engage in conversation with voices that you're unaccustomed to hearing that haven't usually been in the conversation. Because you're, you're de you, you, if you don't create that ownership, you're not gonna create the blend, the hypothesis. You can't. You, and that's uh, you. You need the enterprise to make the right judgments as to what the blend should be. And but I think, I think. I mean, I've had some quite, quite, uh, quite startling early signs that uh, that people will buy in. People are looking for something. Not everybody. It's not going to be right for everybody. But but enough of the very, very best in their disciplines will buy in. But wait a minute, I didn't go to NYU, I went to Columbia, which leads me to think, 60% chance, 35% on that, there's another 5%. Yeah, it's a five, what are we gonna do with it? It's a 5% chance that, uh, that no one will notice. Ah. <laughs> John, that'll never happen. I, that's you. why it's only 5%. But what about the community outside the university? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not insignificant question that has to come up with major universities, particularly one like NYU, right down smack in the middle right. of a vibrant, living community. Right, and of course we learned that more palpably uh, on September the 11th because we were in the, the area below 14th Street that was closed. So, so we, we had, and, and, and the, the, you know, we inhaled the smoke for days and uh, we had 3,500 students 3,500 students who uh, were left homeless that evening, uh, many, many of whom were right across the street in residence halls that we had down by Ground Zero. One of the great th causes of my optimism is that every one of those 3,500 students and every staff member, because people couldn't get home by subway, was housed that evening. Sign-up sheets went up all over campus. Yeah, but this, this is not at NYU. This, is, this was the way New York responded. But, but people, people in, you know, were even more eager to buy into my kind of community notion of, of things. But you're right. We I'm are talking about town. No, no, I, I understand. Now. No, I understand that. that, that uh, I'm just saying that we're, we understand more 
than ever the inter in interface between us and the city. Uh, look, uh, you know, when I, when I examine the assets that, that NYU has, you know, you do a kind of asset analysis and, uh, upon which we're going to build. Asset number one is that we have the finest location in education. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are in what I call the tweediest neighborhood, you know, it's where, where the academics want to live. You know, we don't want to live at 57th Street and Park, you know, you have to wear a suit and a tie all the time. You know, we live in the tweediest neighborhood in the world's capital city. The cultural, economic, educational, we're going to say, capital of the world. So the location, location, location. There are a lot of great universities that aren't going to move. <laughs> Number two, uh, frankly, one of our advantages in trying to get to this, this right blend for the, the new version of the university is that NYU is relatively new to excellence. You know, I mean, we had centers of excellence around NYU, like the Institute of Fine Arts or the Courant Institute of Mathematics back in the 30s and 40s. But we were frequently referred to, and quite accurately so, as a subway school, you know, until you, you got into the 70s and then in the 80s with the great presidencies of John Bradamus and Jay Oliva. We made a leap forward in that 20 years that's, uh, I think, uh, unique. I don't, I don't think there's been a change in an educational institution of that order of magnitude over a 20-year period. And that newness to excellence is good because we don't have the entrenched baronies that places had, uh, have that have had the same departments, you know, going back. And people cooperate more. And, and the, the world of the future is going to be a world of synergy. The third thing we have is uh, what I call a New Yorker's affirmative lack of contentment. You know, we just... We've never been in our golden age. We never will be in our golden age. It's all about becoming better with each passing day. It's a very Teilhardian concept of what we are, you know, very comfortable for me. So just, we, just keep, we just keep moving forward. Uh, there's this great lyrical passage at the end of the great Burns uh, documentary, New York, New York, the last 20 minutes, where he uses the Empire State Building. Now, this is Sexton on Burns. I, he doesn't say this, but my reading of the last 20 minutes is he uses the, uh, the Empire State Building as a metaphor for New York. You know, 1931, teeth of the Depression. We build this thing in 18 months as a kind of, you know, we're, here. we're not going to be bowed. And then he starts talking about this attitude of New Yorkers, you know, the, uh, the, caused by the immigrants as they come in, always looking for something better. You know, it's, you and I were talking about uh, how young we are, right? No, I was and, talking about how young you are. You're, well, I will compliment you and say, you, why? We've been around students who constantly come in saying, it's getting better. A student came up to me the other day at the Stern School of Business. Uh, I was introducing a conference, and they have a beautiful new conference center. And I said to her, do you like the new conference center? And she said, it's a lot better than last year. And I said, do you know that the students next year will be complaining that the water fountains don't work? Because they'll come in and it's there. That's a great, well, okay, so those, those are the assets that an NYU has. Now, what, what, what was the first one I mentioned? New York. Right. We are, after 9-11, I said to our folks, I don't want us to refer to ourselves anymore as New York University. I want us to refer to ourselves as the New York University. I want to affirm our connection to New York. Now, that's not done, that the isn't there. That's d done to affirm New York. It's not done to, to say there, there aren't other great universities in New York. I in, mentioned yeah. the one. Yeah. Well, in, well. Okay. It's many. Not, okay but strike that now. I'm a Fordham graduate. I will not let you say Okay. And I, and I incorporate Princeton and Yale into the greater New York area, and I think that one of the things, you know, you talk about faculty members getting involved in an enterprise instead of being independent contractors. I think that the great educational institutions of New York should, I, at, at, at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences with my friend Lee Bollinger, who, who, who frankly, I uh, proposed to the Board of Trustees as NYU for the presidency of NYU as they were talking to me about it. And I said he'd be better. You know, I think Lee is one of the great educators in America. And uh, when Lee and I get, had a joint appearance at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, one of the things I proposed was that we begin to build together with, with all the great 
educational institutions, the educational capital of the world here in the city, using that. Knowledge isn't a zero-sum game. If, if, if there's a professor of physics who's a terrific physicist, who's entertaining offers from Harvard and NYU and Columbia and Stanford, and he's not going to come to NYU, I'd most of all like him to come to Columbia so that he'd be in the game with us. Mr. President, uh, this leads me to a question that uh, I don't know what the answer to, and maybe you do. What's going to be the impact of 9-11 upon the university itself? And I don't mean NYU, mm -hmm. and I don't mean mm -hmm. Columbia, and I don't mean New York City. I mean upon study, the well, search for excellence. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting because uh, I, I came up for this taping. Uh, with a man with whom I had spent the previous hour, who uh, is a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, a Pakistani, who has been asked by President Bush uh, to begin the work of creating understanding of Islam uh, in the United States. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about is that one v very, very tragic effect of 9-11 could be uh, a quieting of conversation on campuses. Have you seen I, that? I, I, I see dangers of it always. I mean, this, in my view, as you know, you, you invoked uh, earlier in this conversation Cardinal Newman, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the core of the idea of the university is the contest of ideas. And, and as you know, I mean, I had the wonderful experience of, uh, of, of being educated in high school in the finest educational institution I've ever encountered, which was a Jesuit high school. It hasn't existed for 30 years. But my high school English teacher was Daniel Berrigan. And this was in the 50s when Joe McCarthy reigned supreme in Catholicism and especially in Brooklyn Catholicism. And the great thing about Father Berrigan and the folks that taught us was they said, with great courage in that context, we disagree with McCarthy. He's wrong. That's what we think. But we're saying to you, don't believe us any more than you believe him. Listen. Listen to the contest of ideas. and make it. That is the most important thing to be preserved in, in a university. And I think there's, there's been too little courage shown by leaders of, 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 of American educational institutions about maintain. I, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the fact that uh, simultaneously at NYU Law School, simultane same day, we've had uh, President Clinton and Ken Starr. Different floors, not teaching the same class. Okay, my ultimate goal would be to get them to teach the same <laughs> class. But I, I, think, I, I, I think we always have to keep that in mind. And that's one of the dangers uh, 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 that comes out of 9-11. There are other dangers for, for academic institutions that come out of 9-11. A kind of xenophobia about foreign students. We have more foreign students at NYU than any other university uh, in the country. Uh, we have over 6,000 students who are citizens of foreign countries. I will tell you that the perspectives that they bring to the learning process enhance the entire institution. Enhance every, to, you, to, to suddenly become fearful about having those students on this would be a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, the, the whole question of uh, the, the, the civil liberties implications that, that begin to arise in any time national security, in this case quite rightly, becomes uh, more and more emphasized. There's always danger in the delicate environment of the university about civil liberties uh, impl implications. So there are a lot of large concerns that come out of September the 11th. I think that uh, on, on the more obvious concerns that you took off the table, there, there's likely to be very little impact if the situation stays as it is. I mean, everything could change tomorrow with, with, uh, if, if, if there were other attacks on the city. We only have three minutes left, but I want to ask you, following uh, this track, you made of NYU Law School uh, an international institution. I mean, you've been very, very proud of the number of students who have come from other countries. And of your capacity 
as dean and of the school's capacity to cover for your students what is happening in the legal systems of other countries. <clears throat> how will you bring that approach or how will you further that approach at the, on the campus generally rather than just the law school? Well, uh, for, first, it, it's, it's striking how vast New York University is. It really is u quite unique. When I've had Saturday sessions with faculty where I've made myself available uh, 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 about 12 times a month on Saturdays, four sessions on three Saturdays, for a two-hour conversation with between six and eight faculty who just volunteer that they'd like to come and then they're lotterized into the session so they're different people. And to, to have one of the world's great philosophers in the room with a woman who's running the hotel management program at the School of Continuing Education and to realize their colleagues gives you an idea of the vastness. So there are very little, very few universal principles. But I'll answer your question quickly in two ways. The first is the core concept of what a faculty member is, no matter what he or she is doing will run throughout the university. And if, if this enterprise theory comes, that's going to mean the second, which direct, directly relates to what you brought up. The steadfast commitment to opening yourself to voices you're unaccustomed to hearing. And this cuts across so many issues. It cuts across listening to disciplines you're unaccustomed to hearing and critiques of your own discipline from outside. So it, it's, it might simply mean listening to someone from another department. It might mean uh, listening to a person of another gender or another race or in the context you're bringing up where, where, it's, where it's critically important at this moment. And this connects back to 9-11, okay? Listening to people from other, uh, other great cultural traditions or not so great or developing or, or, or deteriorating uh, cultural traditions. And that's, got, that's the core of even Cardinal Newman's idea of the university. I'm glad you brought it back to the idea of the university because I think of no one who can express that better than you, John Sexton. So thank you, Mr. President, for joining me again and good luck at NYU. Thank you, Richard. And thanks too to you in the audience and good luck to you too. I hope you join us again next time and if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Production of the Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, the Malkin Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.